Hey folks, Professor, we're going to talk about discolorations. Now, this is one of the largest chapters in the book. There's a lot of stuff here. I'm just going to kind of nutshell things as we go through so that we're not going to be here all day, but this is an important chapter for you to read in its entirety and make lots of notes. So generally, uh, when we do embalming, two of, of our major goals are to preserve the body and sanitize it. Also, a third object is to restore to an acceptable appearance. Now, those are not mutually inclusive. So it gives you the reference that we have anatomical embalming. Um, we use in our anatomical labs, schools of medicine, things like that. Um, those bodies are very adequately preserved. They are very well sanitized and they are most certainly not open casket material. So those two aspects can happen independent of that third aspect. And discoloration means one of two things. It is either lost in color, lost color, from the natural appearance, i.e. if we exsanguinate, we lose a lot of blood, we lose that underlying red tone, or it is the wrong color. The body has changed, um, not because of an absence, for instance, but it has changed because of decomposition. Obviously, we try to restore that color by the use of dyes. Uh, active dyes will actively stain the body and turn it a color. Uh, inactive dyes are strictly used for us to see if something's in the tank. It will not affect the body at all. Uh, discolorations can also be localized to a single area, such as a bruise, or it can be a generalized discoloration, kind of like liver mortis or post-mortem stain, which can be everywhere. Um, and it gives you examples like I just gave you. So, injection and drainage can remove those intravascular discolorations, kind of a no-brainer, duh. If I'm pushing something out of the vasculature, it's going to remove the discoloration. Um, any bleaching agent can also assist you with some extravascular uh, discolorations, but be wary about that. You're not going to get a complete bleaching unless you do some type of central treatment like a hypodermic injection or a, uh, a cavity pack. Skin is basically one of the definitions of skin, is the organ that forms the outer surface of the human body, which contains both a dermis and an epidermis. And you have a picture of where those are there. Two broad categories. Uh, the hairy stuff, the thin and hairy, which covers the vast majority of our bodies, and the thick and hairless, which is basically palms of our hands, uh, soles of the feet, surface of the digits, etc. For everybody, all ethnic branches, the color of skin is straw color with a pink overtone. Then there are three influencing pigments. Melanin, which is a brown to black. Carotene, which is a yellow. And a hemoglobin or oxyhemoglobin, which gives us the red. That is the blood component right there. So while we all, as a human family, have these, different portions are attributed to different races. So melanin plays the most influential role with skin color, especially ethnic skin color. Carotene and melanin are cellular elements. They're not in the blood. That means no matter what you are, whatever color your skin is in life is what it will be in death. The blood elements um, will break down. They will change color. They do different things um, after death. Uh, red blood cells no longer receive a fresh supply of oxygen, so the bright red color goes down. Um, and basically we're looking at the composition of blood cells. Same. Blood also then drains, okay? That hypostasis happens, and hypostasis can actually start happening uh, in the agonal period. Also be aware of gravitation, okay? So not just pulling the lower areas where the blood just settles because it's there, but the body of an angle, the, uh, at an angle, the fluid, the blood fluid, is going to pour into the area that is lowest. Death pallor is the pale skin in a dead body where pinkness or redness of skin is lost. It's not as noticeable as complexion individuals, but you can notice it um, because the melanin and carotene basically kind of hide it. Okay? In a nutshell, melanin and carotene have much greater influence on the color of skin than the lost post-mortem blood elements. That's why an um, African individual, African descent, is going to stay dark-skinned after death. If it was a blood fluid component, they would change color, go to a much lighter color as the blood fluid is removed or as it decomposes. Restoration of the visible skin to a natural color and acceptable, acceptable appearance 
involves multiple items. The first is the internal use of fluid dyes. And we can also influence some of that with drainage. Um, we might, if we don't get an acceptable appearance just from the internal dyes, then have to go to external agents, such as cosmetics. Uh, we do place special emphasis on warm areas. You're going to learn a lot about warm areas in restorative art. Um, tells you where red pigment is most noticed. And generally, these are the warm areas of the body. So lips, cheeks, blah, blah, blah. These are important. You should print this slide, make a note card, and be ready for it. By adding color to those areas, it creates a natural appearance. So even though we embalm the body, we might have to put a little extra red on the lips or on the hands or wherever it might be um, to make the body look natural. Ornamental cosmetics are typically added to the female in some of those same areas. So a lip gloss, okay, it's not just enough to put the lipstick on, for instance, what it's saying. You might need an underlying tone, such as a pinkish uh, red to replace the lost blood, then put the lipstick on as a ornamental cosmetic, okay? And yes, those people are real, and they have paid ridiculous amounts of money in plastic surgery, apparently. Nearly every body that we get is going to have some type of discoloration. Um, changes and deviations from normal skin may require a change in your embalming technique. What chemicals you use, cosmetic and restorative. Basically, you should be able to look at a body and identify any discoloration that you see on it so that you can come up with the treatment for it. And it is something you should probably discuss at the table, okay, so that the family knows what they're getting into and what you might need to do to fix it. And this just reiterates what I just said. Um, to make your life miserable. Because, you know, we as professors have nothing better to do but make your life miserable. Um, classification by cause requires you to look at the cause. Well, Professor Finn, that's, uh, you know, pretty simple to understand. Right. But you know it's never going to be that easy because it's going to be embedded in a word problem with multiple things to distract you. So it says, for example, a bruise or an ecchymosis can be a blood discoloration if it's caused by trauma a pathological discoloration if it occurs because of disease, or a drug discoloration if it's brought about by the drug. It's important you look at the cause when you are given a question regarding what classification is this, because you will need to find the exact cause of it, and that should be very clearly delineated, even if it is very well hidden. There are six classifications of discolorations by cause. Blood discoloration, pharmaceutical discoloration, or drug therapeutic, pathological or disease discoloration, surface discoloring agent, uh, dyes, inks, dried blood. That's why we want to make sure the blood is always taken off the body as quickly as possible when we are uh, draining it. Reaction to the embalming chemicals, that is your formaldehyde gray and your jaundice green, and decomp changes. And we're back to um, time configurations, post-mortem, anti-mortem. You are alive or you are dead. So anti-mortem, these are the ones most common that you're going to find, blood discolorations, therapeutic, uh, pathological, and surface discoloring agent. The wipe iodine on the body turns the skin yellow. Postmortem, again, blood discolorations, double dips. Uh, we have surface discoloring agents such as blood, etc. Uh, obviously, reactions to embalming chemicals, we're not going to find out on an anti-mortem person because then that's murder. Uh, and then decom. Do not try to argue with your professor that gangrene is decomp because the body is rotting and that happened when they were alive. We're not going to buy it. Location, intra or extravascular. It is either easily removed from within the body because it is in the pipes by which we push fluid and take stuff out, or it's extravascular. We might be able to influence some of it, but we're most certainly not going to get rid of all of it. Okay, blood discolorations, kind of self-explanatory. And there's a great chart right here, table 20 down, that talks all about this stuff. Um, if I were you, I would print this out and I would begin writing it down until I can write it from memory. But that's just me. Intravascular, uh, anti-mortem blood discolorations. This would be important because people like to ask questions about this, both uh, in the professional environment, your professional examinations, as well as your classroom examinations. Hypostasis, blue-black. So the blood is pooling and changing color. Carbon monoxide is almost universal with cherry red. Uh, capillary, capillary congestion uh, is going to give you probably some colors as uh, the uh, hypostasis. And cyanosis is hidden somewhere in the paragraph. That's generally the blue baby thing. We see a lot of that under fingernails. 
when it comes to extravascular anti-mortem blood discolorations, we have bruises or ecchymoses, we have purpura, we have petechiae and hematoma, okay? Liver mortis is our intravascular postmortem blood discoloration. That's all there is to it. If it's in there, it's liver mortis. Remember that then becomes extravascular given time, postmortem stain. Um, Tardieu spots are also something, also something that are extravascular postmortem. We've already beaten it to death now that intravascular blood discolorations are cleared by injection, extravascular or not. Liver mortis, and here's the checklist for liver mortis. It exists because blood gravitates in dependent areas of the body, dependent capillaries. It flows where the gravity is. It only happens after death, okay? That's why it's called liver mortis. You can usually see it 20 to 30 minutes after a person dies. It's well established within six hours, basically right as rigorous is going on. Refrigeration and drugs, uh, especially blood thinners, speed the onset and increase intensity. So it happens quicker and it's much more visible. And the trick is if you push on it, you touch it, it clears. It turns white. If you put the body at different angles, it gravitates. The blood flows somewhere else. If a body's laid on a flat surface, the heart is slightly higher than the head. So blood will gravitate into the facial areas. So what you want to do is raise that head up with the shoulders up so it forces the blood to remain in the upper thorax rather than the upper um, shoulders and head. When the body's shave features are set during embalming, most of the blood gravitates back down, which can also lead to dehydration issues if it's too high. If this discoloration does not clear, the blood does not come back down, probably might be a blockage in the right atrium of the heart or in the right or left internal jugular. So we have a blockage, is basically what it comes down to. Pre-injections were invented to help clear liver mortis. Remember, those old chemicals were very, very harsh. They'd have an immediate reaction. So you'd want to flush it, which is why a pre-injection um, in the past, and still what some embalmers say is called a capillary wash. Okay? And if you're going to use it, you need to use a large enough volume of solution to get rid of the stuff. If it's not used, you might want to use a mild arterial to start pushing things through so you don't have that cosmetic reaction, uh, and then increase the index of your formula or increase your percentage as you go on. This helps prevent liver mortis from becoming a stain. Most of these modern solutions take care of this for you. Massage, articulation will do some good for you, make no doubt about that, but again, don't beat it to death. Don't overdo it. You'll rupture things and you don't want that because that causes blowouts and swelling. Uh, liver mortis is actually can be an advantage for you because if you know it's liver mortis, to clear. And if it is clearing, that means your injection is working. Um, so in that respect, it is a positive. Make sure that you pay attention to the hands. I know we always talk about cleaning up the fingernails and making sure they're nicely trimmed, but make sure that it's getting fluid. You don't want them to see these nice blue fingernails, okay? Um, there's usually a delay between death and prep, uh, which then leads us to discolorations like postmortem stain, carbon monoxide, and what was going to be an easy problem, like an intravascular situation, then becomes more of a problem as an extravascular consideration. With carbon monoxide, it does not clear. Hemolysis has occurred, the blood is broken down, and the stain is in the tissues, they ain't going to change. Ensure that you basically counter stain the tissue, that you put in some extra dye so that when the formaldehyde starts to preserve, it offsets the gray. In case you learn it from the last something slides, extravascular discolorations do not respond well. Injection of a strong arterial solution in the system bleaching some of these colorations. Uh, so if you do have an extravascular blood discoloration, one of your choices is counter stain. Okay, counter stain. You can have both liver mortis and postmortem stain. The liver will wash out, it'll lighten up some, but that postmortem stain is going to be there. Um, and then when it reacts with formaldehyde, your formula solution you're injecting, it will become formaldehyde gray. Tardieu spots, okay? There's pinpoint hemorrhages seen in the areas of advanced liver mortis. So yes, you can have these little, okay, petechiae, little ruptures in basically liver mortis. You can also see these in bruises, okay, bruises. 
So skin capillaries of birth is causing the, causing the petechiae. They cannot be removed. It's an extravascular. Ecchymoses, and here's a good picture of a big old bruise, cannot be cleared as well. And obviously these are problematic because since they're not going to clear, that means you're going to be using um, the opaque cosmetic and you're going to be clown makeup. Okay? It's going to be clown makeup. If the bruise was caused by a needle puncture, it's going to swell out. Um, calls it a blowout. We refer to that as a blowout. So your book confronts three types of results. It's either um, going to bleach a little, preserve, and be okay. Eh. Area's going to distend, i.e. swell. Often a lot of swelling. Yeah. Nothing's going to happen, and you're going to have to address it with hypodermic injections, um, subdermic uh, hypoinjection, or cavity packs. Uh, my experience has taught me for the most, I one and two, unless it's severe trauma. So the hypodermic treatment, look this over. There's a lot of stuff here, but essentially you're using phenol or cavity fluid. You're going in through hidden points of entry to hide the hole. Um, channel, you want to channel. You're going to want to massage and let the stuff work. 15 to 20 minutes and massage as much of the fluid out so it doesn't leak later. Um, then you're going to have to probably seal the hole with some adhesive, some super glue or something. Surface treatment's a bit easier for you because you can just basically slap the stuff on it, wrap it in plastic, um, and away you go. So use cotton, you know, a cotton compress to hold the gels and stuff in place. If you want, remember, use the right type of cotton. If you use a dehydrating cotton, you might actually complicate your situation. You can actually just put the gel on it and wrap it in plastic. That's up to you. But when you're done, take it all off, clean it all off, uh, using an activator or a solvent to get rid of everything. And if you do have any punctures, you're going to want to break out the sealer and adhesive to fix it. So I'm not going to get into um, a lot with these different methods of fixing a hematoma of the eye. Okay? Essentially what you see is raise both carotids. So I'm thinking restricted cervical right there, right? If it's using swelling, we're doing a face freeze or instant tissue, fi instant tissue fixation. Under no circumstances should you ever use a pre-injection solution by itself when you are looking at something with facial swelling, okay? Uh, it gives you a second one. It's basically, you know, um, inject eyes with phenol prior to arterial solution. Wait 20 minutes for it to kind of proceed with injection. So basically, you're going in there with your little buddy, the hypodermic needle, um, squirting in the stuff to burn everything out so it, does, it doesn't inject, and then away you go, preserve the face. Purpura are generally um, those medium sized things. So you have ecchymoses, which are the huge bruises. You have purpura, which is the mid grade. And then you have petechiae, which are the itty bitty buddies. Uh, and we treat everything similar to a bruise because it essentially is just a, a bruise. And the little itty bitty buddies you might be able to just you know, slap some uh, light cosmetic on the body and the petechiae go away. Post mortem stain is a post mortem chemical change, okay? chemical change. It's not a physical change. It occurs where liver mortars was present. You didn't get the blood out in time, and so the blood breaks down and becomes extravascular and stains the tissues. Usually indicates that the body's been sitting around a while. When pressed upon, it does not clear. It is blood decomposition. Uh, another word for that is hemolysis, okay? Hemolysis, blood breakdown of. Injection will lighten it because it's going to flush whatever is still left in the arteries out. Uh, but it's not going to clear it 100%. All the disadvantages of delayed embalming are present with postmortem stain. Um, so you should basically go with guns. Counter stain with a dye. Um, Pre-injection should be avoided. Co-injection is strongly recommended. So add that quote-unquote pre-injection fluid as a co-injection fluid. Um, if you're using a fast firming agent, you want to kind of restrict the firming. You might want to put a humectant chemical in there. Humectant chemicals typically offset the reaction of the formaldehyde, so that will slow it down a little bit. Um, other factors you should consider is everything in your embalming analysis, you know, chapter 10. But realistically, what you're looking at is delayed embalming, which is a subject for actually another chapter. Pharmaceuticals, no-brainer. This occurs as a result of some type of drug use. Now, not the recreational drugs that we all know and love, but drug use as in let's pull open the counter and see how many pills grandma's taken, okay? Uh, generally, the most frequent discolorations in this category are ecchymoses and purpura, bruising, um, jaundice from taking too many pills and screwing up your internal uh, and making everything kind of go off kilter. That is a secondary one. Um, 
bruises are caused by the drug making capillaries fragile and they rupture while jaundice is caused by the shutdown of the liver. Arms are affected by her hemorrhagic discolorations, which is basically what we're talking about. Bruises. Uh, the entire body can be affected by jaundice. Renal fear can uh, be the result of extensive drug therapy to produce a yellow discoloration of the skin. Hello, jaundice. Uh, and typically, you're going to have to, quote unquote, nuke the body. In m most of these cases, you're having to meet the formaldehyde demand by using uh, stronger solutions, in which case you're going to be looking at counter staining, restricted cervical injection, the stuff that you're going to do with any complicated case. Pathological are diseases that occurred in life. You don't catch the disease when you're dead. Yes, technically tissue gas could be characterized as a disease, but realistically it is a complication caused by a disease-causing agent. Okay? But a pathological discoloration is almost universally anti-mortem which causes the body to shift discoloration over the course, uh, even if it is the end stages of a person's life. Gangrene is one of the big ones. If it is a wet gangrene, it's caused by venous obstruction. Infected tissues are um, red to black in color. It means the blood is glowing in and then not going out, which is causing it essentially to sit there, stagnate, and rot, thus making your life uh, miserable and your appendages fall off. Dry is the exact opposite. Nothing is getting in. Nothing is getting in, so your body literally is dehydrating and malnutritioning to the point where it's going to turn um, black, dark, red, brown, whatever it is, and then eventually fall off. When gangrene occurs in the face, it becomes a cosmetic concern to the embalmer. Um, that takes an advanced degree and several decades of embalming experience to make that observation. Thank you, Mayor. Um, frostbite and diabetes are common causes of dry gangrene in the hand uh, as well as the face. And when you get something like dry gangrene, that usually means you're not going to be able to preserve it arterially. That thing is completely occluded, shut down and gone. So you're looking at surface hypodermic needles, uh, doing you know a um, subcutaneous injection and then wrapping the stuff in plastics and uh, getting it done. It appears that just about anything can cause, you know, liver failure, which causes jaundice. So I'm not going to go into all of that again. Um, but when it's down to it, your liver is just can't keep up with everything that's going on. Um, the important trick here is that you realize that the yellow coloration of the skin usually is precluded. Okay, that happens after your eyes turn yellow. So if you look at the white of the eyes, the sclera of the eyes, that is where you find the most clear evidence of jaundice in all cases because the skin tones can greatly influence whether or not you can see the jaundice with any clarity. Addison's is a bronze discoloration produced in the skin. Leukemia can cause petechiae. Meningitis uh, can create cyanosis, uh, blue purpley thing. You see some blue action going on here. Um, tumors, uh, discolorations in and around the tumor itself may be caused by pathological changes. Captain Obvious strikes again. Yes, sir. Uh, lupus, chronic skin disease with scales, red and macular rash. You're not going to do much to be able to fix that with injection. Uh, and back to your buddy, jaundice, three general types, toxic, hemolytic, and obstructive. So how do we know if a body has jaundice? What is the clinical, um, clinical data for jaundice? Blood serum, okay? Healthy human blood serum usually contains 1.0 to 1.5 milligrams per 100 milliliters of bilirubin. Most red blood cells live for approximately 120 days, and no, that photo at the bottom has not been photo retouched. The person was that yellow, okay? Bilirubin is the yellow pigmentation. Anytime the level of bilirubin exceeds 1.5 milligrams per 100 milliliters, the blood begins taking on the... So 1.5 milligrams per 100 milliliters is the threshold. As soon as you get to anything higher, you have clinical jaundice. We've already beaten the whites of the eyes. And people used to believe that the strong arterial solution converted the bilirubin to biliverdin, yellow to green. That's why you turn green. However, the actual reason why is it's not just it's the uh, presence of a strong acidic environment. Okay, a purely strong formaldehyde solution may form an acidic environment since formaldehyde is a reducing agent. The conversion from yellow to green is an oxidation chemical reaction. Okay, it's basically a burning. 
Most jaundice fluids today contain the proper amounts of buffers to try to prevent. That's why we try to avoid fast-acting high-index solutions so that we do not create that acidic environment uh, and thus make ourselves have a problem. It then talks about chemistry. Um, read about it. Okay, read about it. Laugh at the memes, the hamster, my little boy there on the phone. The six methods for the treatment of jaundice. It's important to note that no one solution is going to fix jaundice every single time. Your best experience, um, the proper chemical, and your own training is what you're going to have to basically um, weigh in on. Okay? It is your responsibility as an embalmer to make sure that you have the proper chemicals. Don't say, oh, well, it's not my prep room. No, you're the embalmer. You should know what you need. If your owner refuses to provide it, yeah, that's an owner's problem, but I promise you, you will still be dragged in the court, and you will need to say that, well, I'm not going to carry my chemical, which is reasonable. You shouldn't be forced to buy chemical for the funeral home, okay? But it is still your responsibility to know that you need to have it and that you have told people that you need it. Methods based on the assumption that the embalmer uses a small amount of formaldehyde to prevent discoloration is dumb, okay? You have a body that has nitrogenous waste buildup. Your liver is shot. And now you're saying, I'm not going to inject a lot of formaldehyde to turn green, which means all those waste byproducts are going to eat up what formaldehyde you're injecting, and you are left with an unembalmed body full of garbage that you needed to try to counteract that you did not, and it's going to be a breeding ground for the microbes. The body's going to rot. It's as simple as that. Okay? The body turning green is unfortunate but your goal is still to sanitize and preserve and then restore to a proper viewing condition. You cannot ignore all the other considerations just because you don't want to get a green body. The primary concern is to get the face and hands, the visible areas, clear. Okay, The visible areas clear. Only those areas need to be treated with a jaundice clearing or counter staining solution. As long as the stuff they see looks right, that's all that matters. Everything else can kind of, you know, second, second line, second string. Found that the hands are minimally affected by jaundice, so the head and face are most concerned. So of the visible areas, the face is the most important, the hands are secondary. Restricted cervical is kind of the no-brainer here, okay? You can use two different solutions, a jaundice clearing solution for visible, and then kick it up a notch for the rest of the body. Um, Understand, these are generalities. Okay, these are generalities. You need to use some common sense judgment when um, jumping in and doing a jaundice case. Some discolorations are so severe that embalming by itself will not correct the condition. Generally, when you bump into those, you are using the clown makeup, and you need to be telling your families you're doing that. So it talks about the different methods, and I'm going to kind of just jump through these, okay, because you can read these on your own. Um, something that's really nice is you can use the green, the green fluids, so the non-formaldehyde based. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. There's a sidebar in the book. But understand, if you're in this situation where you just want to try to counter stain it as much as possible and not risk the green, take the quote-unquote acidic forming environment reactant out of it completely and just say, I'm just going to use, boom, here we go. And understand that when you're using some of these things, and I'm not advocating any brands, I'm simply just jumping on the brand that is most familiar to me, Freedom Art, made by the Dodge Chemical Company. You have to use a lot of Freedom Art, according to the label, to get an acceptable appearance, even in a regular case. Okay? Read the label. Follow the directions. Cavity fluids, uh, I discourage the use of that, because if you put cavity fluids in your machine, generally your warranty is void, and you might actually trash your embalming machine. Um, just going to keep going here. The relative counter staining is business as normal, and then you put dye in there to counter stain the jaundice. It adds a solid color base. It aids in your application. So you're worried about the green. You're worried about whatever color you're turning the body. Um, that usually can lead to some blotchiness and whatnot, but that might be a green body. So nephritis is a sallow yellow color. Okay, chronic renal failure. Nephritis, swelling of the nephrons of the Kidneys, um, a sallow yellow color or bronzing resulting from urochrome. This can be confused with Addison, which is a general bronzing as well. Um, nephritis is an anti-mortem disease discoloration. 
looks a lot like mild jaundice, which we saw Addison's disease look more like really dark tan. Uh, the discoloration is generally treated by just throwing some dye in the solution, and away we go. But you have to deal with the buildup of ammonia. So make sure you're using concentrations high enough to counteract it. Nephritis is also usually accompanied by diabetes, which leads to gangrene, all sorts of other problems. Again, look at the embalming analysis. What is the entire body telling you? The case scenario you are reading uh, in your uh, material telling you, and go from there. Dyes are essential when tracking distribution in gangrenous tissue. If you have gangrene, you need to put some dyes as a tracer so you can try to see what's going on. If you feel that you're going to get good circulation and drainage, um, you might want to try a pre-injection with this. Um, more often than not, though, you're not. It's just simple as that. You're not going to be using a pre-injection with this type of situation. You might want to go waterless, as you would with some of, with most um, delayed embalming cases. That is the method of last resort. You go waterless with it. Waterless does not mean lots of embalming chemical. It simply means that you're using nothing but um, co-injection buffers to supply the majority dilution of your solution okay, with your proper chemical. Say that again. You can still use the two or three bottles to meet the formaldehyde demand that you're going to use, but instead of using tap water, you're grabbing nothing but bottles of co-injection solution and probably water corrective buffering solution so that you are maintaining a certain environment in the body. Surface discoloring agents are basically any dyes. Any of you that have grabbed the business end of a Sharpie without a cap, you've gotten a surface discoloration. Most of them, with the proper solvent, it disappears, life is good. Surface discoloration should be cleaned prior to injection so you can get up as getting preserved. It's kind of a no-brainer. Mechanical and chemical methods can be used to remove surface discoloration. So mechanicals are anything um, that basically kind of a braid, cloth, gauze, brushes, scrubbing pads, and obviously you're going to want to use a lubricant. Soap and water is a really good lubricant so you don't rip skin off. Chemical is any solvent. Okay? The most common one we kind of bump into is blood. People die some really horrible deaths even in a healthcare institution. They want to get the blood off of you as soon as possible. Uh, use of a mild liquid soap with an abrasive cloth, such as a cheesecloth or a gauze pad, assists and removes this stuff. Most other surface discolorations respond well to dry wash solvents like acetone, um, whatever you got out there to actually, you know, take care of it. And there's a subchapter in the book that talks about proper solvents um, with what they remove. There's also a subchapter of this in the Professional Trade School's Thanatochemistry book. Embalming chemical reaction is kind of a no-brainer. You inject the stuff, something happens. Um, discolorations can occur during or following embalming of the body. You can inject the body, see nothing going on, and then the next morning walk in and it's obscenely the opposite color because it took that much time for the dye to actually do something. So some uh, embalming discolorations, um, I disagree with the razor burn, okay, but that's because you shaved while embalming, which caused the razor burn. You kind of get the idea. Dehydration, you should know what dehydration is. It's a lack of water. So a drying of the skin, okay? Drying of the skin. The color goes from yellow to brown to black. That would be insanely important. You can cause dehydration by injecting too much arterial solution, injecting too strong of an arterial fluid, using too much drainage, okay? Letting the water just pour right out. Loss of the abrasion, okay? and lacerations. So the dehydration can be body-wide. It can also be localized. Dehydrated tissues cannot be bleached. It's done. If they are starting to turn yellow and brown, it is game over. It is a wax restoration. Um, use of opaque cosmetic to hide the discoloration is your only way to solve it. And if you need to re-add items, you could use some tissue building. You'd actually add some wax, um, but you're going to be putting cosmetic on it. You have to be able to distinguish between dehydration and decomposition. Dehydrated skin is very hard to touch, where decomp is usually very soft, very wet, because you got skin slip, you got water building up, because that's a byproduct of decomposition. Uh, personally, I don't see how you could confuse the two, but okay, we assume that you get. Strong chemicals or edema fluid, a high salt-based fluid, uh, may dehydrate fingertips, in which case you better hit that up with some massage cream, mineral oil, or even a... Um, a humectant, a stray humectant with no preservative value chemical. Put it in a spray bottle and just kind of spray it on there. A nice little wetting agent. 
Um, you might need to use some tissue to fix dehydration um, after you're done embalming, just to kind of plump them out a little bit. You got the little web in your fingers. Uh, you get that at the same manner. A little bit of mineral oil, blah blah blah, tissue build. Dehydration of the lips. Okay, again, you're looking at a lot of the same things. Tissue builder after injection. Uh, you, there's still issues. You might have to use some wax, um, cosmetic, usual sort of thing. Many embalmers add a humectant co-injection um, to retain moisture. Again, look at the cosmetics you use. If it says something like humectant arterial or oil-based, it's probably a good indicator that you indeed have something in you or in that fluid that will um, add a moisture um, a moisture keeper, moisture preservative. Okay. We already talked about the yellow to green jaundice. I'm not really going to beat it to death. It's actually believed, because it's an oxidation, requires O2, requires oxygen, right? That if you prevent oxygen from getting to the body, you're actually going to reduce the reaction. So coating the face and hands with massage cream can possibly help to prevent a severe discoloration. But remember, it's important to keep preservation at the high end of the spectrum rather than just worrying about the discoloration. Counterstating is one of the treatments. If that fails, you're breaking out the pancake. Okay? Embalmer's gray. This happens when you cannot or you neglect to remove as much of the blood as possible from the body. The condition can be avoided by the injection of a large enough volume of arterial solution accompanied by, by thorough drainage and aspiration. So basically, yeah, if you do your job right, you could, you're probably going to avoid this unless you have like really bad post-mortem stain where you're just done with it. Um, keep the head and the shoulders high. We've already mentioned why. And if you do get embalmer's gray, it's pancake. You're breaking out the foundation, the opaque foundation, and just covering it up. It is what it is. Flushing, I actually encountered flushing a week or two ago in one of my embalming labs when I was uh, working with my students uh, using a drain tube drain tube and it was an excellent example of flushing, opening and closing it and watching, you know, the, the discoloration in the face appears. And this is when you are actually doing your job. Arterial solution is going everywhere, but you're not getting enough drainage. So it's just coagulating up in the upper extremity and the heads and you're done because you need to get it out. Blood is going to look like it's taking on a cyanotic appearance, like if you squeeze your finger, it starts turning dark purple. That's exactly what happens. And the way you fix it is simply by finding a new hole for it to go somewhere. Um, open some more drainage. You know, if you're in the right common and nothing's working there, you might need to jump to the left side or open up uh, a leg or even just go in and do a heart tap. It is what it is. And it gives you um, the re results or actually the causes. Leaving drainage closed too long when using intermittent or alternate. Uh, in my case, I was actually trying to build up some pressure, so that was my clue that I needed to open it up. Razor abrasions, uh, razor burn, it's going to turn the area dark brown like a because it is a dehydration, and realistically, massage cream will help you prevent that from occurring, but you are going to have to probably use some wax and some opaque cosmetic to kind of hide it. Darkening may be considered an advantage as it will indicate the area has dried. Basically, you know, if it has turned that brownish, dark brownish color, it's not going to leak, which is why it's good for you. It's still bad that you have the abrasion. It's still bad that it was caused by shaving. Uh, dry tissues accept cosmetics and wax very well. So if it is dried and abraded, then you should be able to put the stuff on like a champ and be done with it. Uh, if you need to force the issue, break out the hair dryer. You're going to see that several times throughout, the, uh, throughout this book. Hair dryer to dry things out. Post-mortem bruise, a rare. Um, it occurs when you actually bruise the body after death by putting on too much pressure. It's common in the elderly, people, uh, people taking blood thinners because the ruptures happen so easily. can occur with eye nucleations. Basically, anything that would normally cause a bruise is going to cause a bruise after death as well. Uh, if you're going to bump into that, restricted cervical, all the techniques you've learned about bruising will then apply as well. In bodies dead for a long time, uh, we may need to inject a large volume of strong solution, which then goes through and starts going crazy, creates a raised rash-like appearance, blowouts. Um, also, it's going to cause excessive preservation, excessive dyeing, uh, which leads to formaldehyde burn. Tissues will be very firm to touch, and the fluid can remain there um, 
forever. Just the, the tissue is completely discolored by the dyes and the fluid. So be very careful when playing with this stuff. Decomp, okay, decomp are postmortem discolorations brought about by the action of bacterial or autolytic enzymes. Uh, colors may be yellow, green, or blue, black to black. Okay, yellow, green, blue, black to black. Examples are progressive skin color changes, marbling of veins on the skin surface. What you see here is actually an artist's um, with a live person all made up to look like decomp, and I'm telling you, that looks pretty dang good. Five signs of decomp. Odor, desquamation, gas, purge, and color changes. These are the five signs of decomp. The first external sign is the greening over the right inguinal or iliac area of the abdomen. So the bottom right, okay, the bottom right part of the abdomen, you see that little green thing, that is the first sign of decomp. It enlarges, outlines the colon, basically large intestine, and it starts creeping everywhere else. Skeletal tissues change color as well. And it is just as we've seen, yellow, green, blue, black, the black, same exact thing. In this picture, you have a pretty good idea where the decomp is. You see the marbling of the, um, marbling of the veins and whatnot all over. There's your marbling, and over here you see there's no decomp evidence. You see it's starting to creep into the arm, but for the most part, the arms, maybe even, well, we see it in the neck, so, you know, that's going to be an issue because it's in the neck. Um, but the face might be okay. But you can see the face is pretty much pushed all the way back. The blood has probably been pooling in there. So you're going to have fun fixing that. The spider webbing um, is known as marbling. Okay, spider webbing is known as marbling. You can lighten these discolorations, but they're not going to go away. Okay, you're never going to get decomp color changes like this to go back to normal. Um, surface compresses, hypodermic injection. That's the way to go. Make sure you're doing hypodermic injection, especially on the walls of the abdomen, okay? Especially in all these areas where you have this really bad decomp, like right here, because of the fact that if you don't, that skin is already decomposed. You don't want to bump into a situation where, yeah, you might have preserved some areas, but now the guts are going to ride out from underneath you. Um, you want to make sure you're treating those uh, walls of the abdomen like you would in an autopsy. So a discoloration is any abnormal color appearing in a dead human body. Um, obviously, we can see discolorations happen anti-mortem as well. Um, we're not going to go into a lot of this stuff just because of the fact that we have a whole class dedicated to the discolorations. However, it is testable material. I'm not going to discuss it now, but I can actually ask you about it. So please read it. If you've taken restorative art, most of this stuff should be you know, fairly well for you. A skin lesion is any traumatic or pathological change in the structure of skin. And the object of your job is to sanitize it, clean it, get rid of the stuff that cannot be used, that skin gone, and then preserve and dry all the remaining tissues. You have four categories of basic skin lesion. Unbroken skin but discolored, less dangerous. Skin scaling, skin that is broken or separated, and postural or ulcerative lesion. Uh, Pretty much that pustular or ulcerative lesion is probably the most dangerous, although obviously the skin being broken and separated and even the scaling is going to be also very uh, bad for you. All eruptive and scaling skin conditions should be treated as if they were contagious and infectious because, hello, they probably are. Disinfect them thoroughly. Spray it on there. Give it the amount of time, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Go back and do your job dressed appropriately. Skin may remain on discolored from any variety of disease or even genetic cases. Generally, discoloration will result from an increase in blood flow into the tissues of the affected area and some swelling. So basically, blood getting there, just regular um, swelling reaction. You know, you have an invasion of something, your body reacts immediately in inflammation. That's going to cause this and swelling. If the air is going to be viewed, it tells you what to do. Um, afterwards, you might need to go in uh, and do the whole hypodermic treatment. With scaling skin, you're going to be using um, probably a lot of, um, I don't want to say cotton towels because the owners get really bent when you use a lot of cotton, but you're definitely going to be cleaning the face a lot, uh, shaving it, wiping it with solvent, uh, probably using massage and other moisturizers to try to keep the skin as moist. 
Um, if you have any doubt to preservation, you better just go ahead and break out the autopsy gel and get her done. With broken skin gives you three types of broken skin, abrasions, blisters, and skin slip. Abrasion is a friction, anti-mortem um, anti friction burn, basically, okay? Road rash, rose raspberries, um, those type of things are abrasions. When it dries, dark brown or black. They have to be tried or treated prior to restoration. If you don't fix it prior, you're not going to be able to cosmetize and make things look right later. So apply massage cream to the surrounding areas because the stuff's going to leak. And while it's leaking, you don't want it to stain the good tissue. If you have to, break out the hair dryer to help it along its way in drying it out. Uh, apply compresses and hypodermic needles with um, phenol or cavity solution. Cannot be bleached, okay? Dehydration cannot be bleached. So if you are putting a cavity pack on it, the only reason why you're doing it is to dry it out slash preserve it. Blisters. Blisters are elevations of the epidermis, the outer skin, containing a watery liquid. Liquid, When they're present on the face, um, you can basically just kind of dry them out with a the gel and then treat with cosmetics. Uh, try to maintain the... Um, the skin itself so you're not making extra holes, but realistically, if they're anywhere else, you're going to puncture them, okay? Lip blisters can be glued under. No treatment is needed except creation of new lip line with cosmetics. I think that actually goes against within the RA book, which says you should pop all blisters, dry them off, and do a wax restoration. But you can look that up and let me know. Um, personally, I go right for the open and drain. It's loose water. It's dead tissue. I'm going to get it out. Cauterize it. Dry it. Uh, and then attack it with wax and attack it with cosmetic to make it look right. Personally, I think that's the best issue, and apparently I did research it at some point um, because the two restorative art books, one by uh, Dr. Ralph Clicker and the one by Jay Sheridan Mayer, both share that assumption. Blisters are typically associated with second-degree burns, okay? Second degree. First degree is redness. Third degree is charring. Uh, second degree is blisters. Skin slip, one of my favorite things to encounter in the lab, absolutely hate it, also known as desquamation, is the separation of the upper layer of skin, the epidermis, from the deeper dermal layer and is one of the signs of decomposition. Your goal is to preserve, make sure everything is dried to make a base for your restoration. Remove all the skin, all of it. You're just going to have to do it because it's already dead and it's just going to rot. Um, Peel away all loose skin, then use a scalpel to cut at the point where the freed skin joins the attached skin in an attempt to try to save as much as you can. Uh, view the protocols. Review the protocols. If you've been through RA, you should know this stuff fairly well. Okay. Lesions. Talks about um, different lesions. Whoopsies. Talks about um, bed sores. Bed sores are a lot of fun. Okay. Um, one of the most disgusting things you'll ever see are bed sores especially the really big ones like this poor guy. I mean, you can almost see right here. That's just, you know, that's deplorable. All you had to do was move the person around. Bed sores are completely preventable, as you will learn in the class and probably some other classes. Uh, very large. Usually, pen and areas don't get a lot of movement, often accompanied by bacterial infection, uh, which results in skin breaks, drainage, and the odor is uh, probably second only to decomp when it comes down to it. So review the protocol. Review the protocol. Basically, you're going in there, surface packs, wrapping in plastic, etc. There's a great little chart here that kind of um, comes up things for you, table 20-2. Uh, and again, this is a great way to review. Put this on a note card. If nothing else, just look at this, and you should be in some decent condition. Preservation is always your most important goal with any unnatural discoloration. So hanging and strangulation. Um, might actually rupture the stuff in the neck, which could be a problem. It can lead to one of two situations. Excessive, extensive blood discoloration in petechiae, local blood congestion on the face when it's able to enter via the arteries but not exit via the veins. Important, okay? It goes in, but it can't come out. We basically have wet gangrene there. No blood or discoloration is present in the face because the veins are able to drain. Nothing could go in, but the stuff that was there got out, okay? So those are two conditions you need to know about, and I would probably flashcard that. And the first type, all the stuff goes in, nothing comes out, stuff is going to swell. Eyes are going to pop. Tongue's going to pop. 
any delay in finding this body uh, um, is going to make post-mortem stain just an absolute certainty. Simply relieving the pressure will probably help you with some of the stain as well as some of the swelling. Uh, obviously, they hung themselves. Here in Florida, that means you're going to the medical examiner. That's going to help relieve the pressure immediately. So restricted cervical with no pre-injection, solution type, depends on analysis. And you can see, 2% to 2.5, that's only slightly higher than normal. Uh, markings from the rope may cause abrasions. So you're going to have to be very careful uh, when you are restoring the body to try to cover some of that up or make sure they bring in appropriate clothing to hide it. Burn bodies, you can get burns by a variety of ways. Heat, radiation, chemicals, and electric shock. Um, it's not always the local effect of the burn that should concern you, but the systemic effect brought about by major burns, the infection, lack of blood, hence dehydration, and shot up um, infrastructure to inject, kidney failure, blah, blah, blah. Three classifications, you have first, second, and third degree burns. Um, there's also a fourth carry, fourth degree. It is mentioned in restorative art and several other texts. Uh, basically, you have, starting at the first degree, you have erythema, um, burn is only on the top of the skin, just a little bit of swelling. It just kind of is what it is, but mostly it's redness and irritation. Second degree, you have edema, you have blisters, um, specific blisters called bullae. Though that would be important because we don't see this in many other books or any other areas. There's destruction of the deep layers of the epidermis and upper layers of the dermis. It's gotten through the top portion of skin. You're going to have a problem. It's probably going to get you a little bit of scarring going on. You have third degree. The tissue is brisket. It is done. It is charred. The epidermis, dermis, the hair follicles, basically the skin is destroyed. And then you have fourth degree burn, which is basically complete incineration. Okay, complete incineration. Nothing but skeletal remains left. Fourth degree burn is essentially cremation. Problem with second degree burns is those poor people usually live. Um, blisters or second degree burns are rarely seen as these blisters are open during treatment. They pop them to get them done. Um, very high preservative demand. Waterless is definitely recommended. Okay? Dye is a tracer. Creating a dry skin is going to be a problem. So you can do um, cosmetic work. So you're going to be removing skin, applying compresses and gels until the body's solid and preserved and nice and dry. Clean it with the solvent, dry it out again. It's really, really, really problematic. Um, also, the odor accompanied with this is an issue. So autopsy gel, plastic garments, and powders will help you with that. Uh, use of a unionol is probably highly suggested, especially to help control odors and leakage. Uh, don't forget to tape over those cloth portions of the unionol. Sufficient embalming powder should be spread in the unionol, especially over the burned areas, uh, to make sure that it is doing its job. Okay. Worm sutures may be more successful than a baseball stitch because the skin is just going to pull through. Electrocution um, is mostly going to be on the hands and feet, entrance and exit points more so than anywhere else. Uh, low voltage burns are really just reddened areas with maybe some blisters. Uh, high voltage burns can just basically incinerate you. You're looking at like third degree and fourth degree burns. Rigor mortis happens very rapidly in these deaths. If you're electrocuted, rigor is going to hit you much quicker than normal. Most of these bodies have been autopsied, so you're going to be under autopsy protocols anyways, which actually make your life a little bit easier, uh, especially in regards to doing hypovalve injection because more than likely the circulatory system is going to be shot, especially in a high-voltage burn like you see there. Carbon monoxide poisoning, well, it's not the worst thing in the world. You know, For us, it's probably one of the better ones in regards to making our lives less complicated. Um, very low blood uh, viscosity. The blood just basically drains right out for us. Uh, the, the pinkness in the skin is what causes the problem because that will react to formaldehyde gray. So make sure you're um, maybe using uh, not fast firming formulas. Okay, probably using a co-injection. Probably a good idea. Again, rely on your embalming analysis. What else is the case scenario telling you? What do you need to do to you know come over that? Come and corroborate. Uh, jugular is drainage. We see that whenever we have problems, we're going right to the neck rather than anywhere else. Uh, carbon monoxide poisoning is not itself a tremendous problem to the professional embalmer. We can usually take care of it very easily. Drownings, you're looking at liver mortis, petechiae, cyanosis. Um, 
Sometimes the water is cold enough that it actually stimulate or simulates uh, refrigeration. Uh, if gases actually bring the body to the surface. You're usually problemed already uh, because of the fact that one, the body is swelling because gas is going on there, and also everything is rushing into the bottom part of the body, which is going to cause decomp. And there's an example of a floater. So with drownings, you just have to treat it individually. You would any other embalming case. Each case is its own scenario. Abrasions, lacerations may be present. Uh, warm water could actually speed up decomp in the critters. You'd be surprised what the critters can do to a body. Um, huge concern, especially if not autopsied, is purge. Take precautions. Pack throat. Pack everything that needs to be packed. Restricted cervical should be your go-to. Aspiration should be thorough. Two to three bottles of cavity fluid, one per every major cavity. Thorax, abdomen, pelvis, probably a good idea. Reaspiration and reinjection, probably also a pretty good idea. Gunshot wounds, well, swelling, bruising, all the fun stuff that comes with gunshots. Um, if the bullet passes into the cranial vault and body's not autopsied, leakage may cause brain purge. You're going to be packing the nose. You'll be aspirating uh, the cranium in order to get some of the stuff out. Plug the hole where the bullet got in, right? Um, pay attention to what you're doing. Again, embalming analysis. What is the body telling you? Aligned fractured bones, temporary sutures uh, probably need to be employed to make sure you have positive results. And sectional embalming is suggested for the autopsy body because apparently you need to do that on autopsy body since there's no, you know, vascular cure anymore because they autopsied the body. Sometimes you just wonder. On autopsied bodies, you probably still want to go with restricted cervical just so you can inject the head uh, with an instant tissue fixation or a face freeze and the rest of it, um, however you might need to do it. Pulsation is used 20 pounds PSI. Um, I like they give you numbers, but realistically, depends on your machine. Make sure you are familiar with the machine you are using, and if you are working on a new machine, make sure you talk to your um, representatives that sold it to you or people who have worked with it to give you the best idea of what to expect. Everything else basically is like treating the autopsy head, which is done in another chapter. So read it, but nothing should be new. Obviously, if you have too much swelling reduction via... Um, Channeling reduction via inside or excising tissue is probably going to be something you need to do. Um, use glasses, okay? Use glasses if you can to hide the stuff. Um, there is a supplement in the textbook, okay? The supplemental section way in the back talks about how to specifically handle eye problems. Poisoning, well, poisoning depends on the poison using a lot of other factors. Long term, it's a jaundice issue as well as all sorts of stuff. Um, Something that happens very quickly, not so much of an issue for us because the body died and we're getting it in fairly good condition. Most bodies dead by poisoning have been autopsy, so it's an autopsy protocol. Uh, dyes as tracers, sectional embalming, etc. One point is not recommended for blunt force or mutilation um, because of ruptures in the vasculature you do not see. So fact of the matter is business is normal. If it's mutilation, you simply treat what you have. and Apply some good common sense there. Exsanguination, excessive blood loss to the point of death, you know, death by vampire. Um, blood loss is not always external. It might actually leak, aneurysm or something leaks into the body, which creates an extravascular pressure, which makes your life a little miserable, which means you might have to actually go into a sectional embalming. Exsanguination is more of a color, a lack of color, than an actual discoloration itself. Um, so you're going to be adding some dyes to make sure things happen. If rupture happens in the aortas, it's going to be a sectional embalming because the aorta has been ruptured, it's just going to pour into the chest, you're not going to get anywhere with it. If it's in the veins, you're going to be having some drainage issues, short, circ short circuiting, and even shell embalming might be an issue for you. Use of the right internal jugular is highly recommended. Get into that main point of, um, of drainage. Higher than normal solution strength is suggested because whatever gets to where it has to go needs to do the job of many. It's probably be... Um, Employ sectional embalming so that you're touching the areas individually. Strong solutions and then hypodermic work should be thorough and um, done if you need it. Um, generally, it's the same exact protocols for an autopsy. So if you've learned it once right, the rest of this should not be an issue. But do read the rest of the chapter to make sure that you're getting all the bits and pieces in there. Refrigerated bodies, well, keep the head elevated. You know, 6 to 12 hours liver can progress from uh, just a red to a variety of hues up to blue-black, which is essentially extravascular postmortem stain and then decomp. 
Um, you're going to see that postmortem stain and tardieu spots are prevalent. Hemolysis is speeded by cooling. Capillaries are more porous. And bodies refrigerated more than 12 hours are going to have some type of stain. Do not mistake the liver mortars for preservation. If a body has been refrigerated for several days, which is quite common these days, you might see some dehydration, tip of the nose, lips, fingers, all that sort of stuff. So much a problem if it's been covered. Totally a problem if it hasn't been. Okay? Mold, mold sucks. So you're going to have to cut it off. Okay? You have to cut it off and then swab it with something to burn it to death. Cosmetic treatment is an absolute certainty. Embalmed bodies are uh, stored. You should have some air circulation to prevent you think, think it's going to be an issue. Spray it with a surface preservative, uh, preventative, mold preventative, or Vaseline, something that mold is not going to like. Okay. Darkness and moisture encourage mold growth. Your morgue is both of those. Uh, molds grow in both unembalmed and embalmed bodies. It's a fungus. It doesn't care. Cold molds will have grow inside of your morgue. Warm ones, not so much. So, folks, large chapter, thank you for your attention, and we will see you next time.